All right. We are live. All right. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa mula. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my race family. Welcome again to our weekly Wednesday discussion in which every week we'll be going over a book on the new Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration and the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. And so last week we started with the introduction to the book, which kind of helped lay the groundwork for the purpose of the book and what are we are going to be learn, learning about mass incarceration and the history of uh, the oppression of Black Americans in America through this book. And so today we're going to be starting with the first chapter, which is titled uh, Rebirth of the Case, the, the case system essentially. Now, originally we were going to go over one chapter a week, but upon reading through the chapters, uh, I've come to no notice that the chapters can be very condensed, right? They can have a lot of information in them. And so I felt it necessary to kind of take a step back and instead of going over one chapter a week, which may be really difficult to go through all that information in a thesis manner, we will instead split the chapter. So we'll do, instead of one chapter a week, we'll do half a chapter a week. So that way we're able to cover um, very important ground and not move too fast or we're really making sure that we are um, reflecting upon and really understanding the material that the author is presenting to us, right? So inshallah ta'ala, moving forward, we'll, we'll do basically one chapter for two weeks. So two, maybe each chapter will be dedicated two weeks worth of our time. Maybe sometimes three, depending on the length of the chapter. Just so that way we, we take our time and make sure that we really benefited from what this book has to, to offer us. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and jump right into our summary of chapter one. Now, for chapter one, it's split up in, I'd say around I think four or five seconds. First, it starts off with the birth of slavery, the death of slavery, the birth of Jim Crow, the death of Jim Crow, and then the birth of mass incarceration. So it's roughly in around five segments. We are going to go over today really just three. And quick question for the, for the audience, who here loves history? Do I have any history lovers in the room? Feel free to either raise your hand or do, do a shout out. Who here is a lover of history? All right, see Savannah has her, has her hand up. Anyone else here loves history? Well, if Sister Nahil is the only one that loves history, then you guys are gonna have a tough time because this chapter here is essentially dedicated to history. The purpose of this chapter is to kind of give the reader a historical overview on the black oppression in America. In order for us, in order to ignite the conversation of where we are now, or at that time where the status of black America was during 2010. So this chapter is heavily focused on educating the reader and reminding the reader of our history. So with that being said, I'll do my best to give a summary that is engaging and, and, and uh, attention grabbing for those who may not uh, like history, but just be warned, this chapter is very historically heavy. So I have over here just some notes I, I, I took down uh, in order for us to make sure we have a cohesive discussion. So she begins this chapter with a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, who um, is an African-American scholar back during the Reconstruction era of, of U.S. history. And she shares this quote, which, is, which says, the slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. And this is the quote that she opens the chapter with. This quote, of course, is referencing um, after the time of the, after the Civil War and the Amalgamation, the um, law that essentially uh, freed the, the slaves. Uh, not, not 
completely, but it's basically a screen display. And just kind of highlights um, for us through this quote that every time throughout US history, progress was seemingly made to end structural uh, systematic racism or to end um, black oppression, the system and the people always found new ways to kind of reinvent the wheel. So that way, while things changed, things essentially stayed the same. And through going over these different points of history, the author wants, hopes to kind of show us how no matter how much progress was made throughout U.S. history, there was always new inventive ways being made to force the Black community back into second-class status, essentially. And she discusses here um, about, she actually um, speaks about something in regards to um, today. Now, of course, I really wanted to share with you guys when we talk about um, how things have changed throughout U.S. Throughout, throughout U.S. history in regards to black oppression, right? A lot of people may say, well, yes, well, you know, there are still possibly, there are still possibly still um, laws and systems put in place to force black Americans into the second class type of status. It's still, it's still progress, right? We're still doing, we're still doing better than we were before. Slowly but surely we are making progress. And she said this quote that I really wanted to share with you guys, I kind of, really kind of made me kind of take a step back and be like, huh, I didn't really think about that. And here's what she said. Any notion that evolution of the social path reflects some kind of linear progress would be misguided. Basically, the, this, this idea that, you know, while the, the, the changing of how black, black Americans are oppressed is changing, but the fact that it's changing shows that slowly but surely it's evolving and getting getting better, this is not a good mentality to have, she's saying. And this is why she gets. She says, for it is not at all obvious that it would be better to be incarcerated for life for a minor drug offense than to live with one's family, earning an honest wage under Jim Crow regime, notwithstanding the ever-present threat of the point. And, you know, when I read this quote in the book, it just kind of, really just kind of makes you have to kind of Right. We think about back during the, the Jim Crow era, how a lot, how discrimination, systematic discrimination, segregation, um, black coat, black club, the black codes, and different laws that were implemented to take away a lot of the rights of African Americans, and of course that was horrible, right? And we look at when we think of mass incarceration, you think, okay, that's bad, but it's not as bad as it was back then. But when I read this. This quote it kind of makes you think, like, is it really better? Is mass incarceration really better than the Jim Crow laws back then? Basically, being, for, being forced away from your family, pulled away from opportunities for, for minor offenses. It really just kind of um, makes you think. And so, with that, the author then goes into kind of an overview of the birth of slavery in this nation. And I believe last week, Brother Jeffrey, who unfortunately isn't here with us at the moment, he kind of discussed this uh, briefly. Essentially, she mentions like during the early period, the early colonial period, um, there wasn't really much difference between poor black and poor white. They were both basically kind of on the same level of being cheap or free labor through being indentured service. And indentured service essentially means that someone via contract essentially kind of signs their life away. They're forced to work for somebody, provide free labor for somebody in order to pay off some sort of debt. And once, they're, once they pay off whatever debt that they're owed through their labor, they essentially become free. And so during this time, the poor whites and poor blacks were kind of essentially on the same level in regards to how they were used by the elite class, who at that time were plantation owners, right? Those were the top class during in, in the Americas of, of, of this time. And at this time, she mentions that not all Blacks were slaves, per se, as more indentured um, servants. People, those who were forced into 
um, servitude via via contract. And at this time, as I mentioned, black and white bonds were kind of on the, the same level. But then she speaks about um, an event called Bacon's Rebellion. And we're not going to go into vivid detail about it, but essentially Bacon's Rebellion was an event in which um, this man named Samuel Bacon, he led this revolt against the elite class in order to kind of accumulate land that the elite class got from the, the Native, Native Americans. He was able to um, bring together both poor whites and poor blacks during this time. And eventually, of course, this rebellion was um, taken down. And of course, people were um, executed for it. But this event, according to the author, kind of ignited something within the, within, within the elite class. They felt, according to the author, they needed to, needed to kind of re-strategize how to Hold, keep hold of their control and their dominance. And how they did this, according to the author, was one, they started focusing more on creating slaves than through indentured um, servants. So slavery heavily expanded during this time. On top of that, the elite class was focusing on dividing, dividing conquer right, dividing the poor whites and the poor blacks. And this was primarily done according to the According to the author, through um, giving uh, poor whites special privileges such as more land, as well as the authority to police, um, police, police slaves, thus kind of creating this superiority complex between the poor whites and the poor blacks. And at this time, according to the author, this is when white supremacy really started to um, gain a stride. And thus, slavery from here on heavily, heavily expanded. And this is where, of course, Africans were, were officially at the absolute bottom of, of the barrel. And she discusses also, before going into the end of slavery, how slavery played a very key role in the early documents of um, the development of the US at, at, that, at that time. And she points out that while the idea of slavery may have seemed contradictory to the traditional philosophy of our founding fathers, of the, of the American founding fathers, of course, that all men are created equal. She says that basically this was dealt with with the idea that, you know, Negroes were less than, they were not true men, they were less than equal. Kind of similar to the way that the, the Europeans saw a Native American, these savages, uncivilized beasts that were less than human. Thus, it was okay for them to, you know, be put in, put in slavery. And this was kind of the um, mentality of the Americans at, at that time. And she also makes reference to how much impact slavery really had on the development of, of, of the U.S. Constitution. And she makes reference to the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now, real quick, I want to ask, who here can remind us what was the Three-Fifths Compromise? All right. Can you repeat your question, Kenneth? What was it again? Yeah. So yes, the author makes a reference to three fifths, the three fifths compromise, in order to highlight for us how central slavery was to the development of of the U.S. at the time. And so I'm asking one of you to kind of give us a brief reminder of what the three fifths compromise was. What is the three fifths? So we'll be calling people now. All right, I'll let you guys go this time, but I have more questions, so just to uh, keep that in mind. So quick overview, the three fifths compromise, if I can explain it just very briefly. Um, essentially, there was this fight for power between the larger states and the, the, the smaller states, right? And essentially, the smaller states wanted to count Basically, this is what we're just kind of talking about, the number of representatives that each state has in terms of legislators, right, in terms of those who make it pass laws. Um, the small states wanted slaves to be considered a person in order to increase their political power, right? Um, the larger states didn't want that. They 
argue that these people are not people, they are property, and this is their right. So in the Constitution, they came you know, with the three big compromise, which stated that slaves, three out of five slaves, constituted one person, right? So not one slave was not a whole person. Three out of every five slaves would be considered one person, and so that would add to a state's uh, political power. And she just kind of makes reference of it as a kind of reminder for us of just really how dis disgusting um, we, we, we were back then. And this is, um, our, this is something that I think we need to kind of remind ourselves from time to time. I know this is like a hard discussion to have, but really just kind of highlights for us how little um, uh, the black community was seen at that time, how low they were, that they're not even really considered a whole person to, to, the, sound, to the, the founding fathers at, at that time. So from here, she then goes on to the death of slavery, right? So now we went from, so now we're going into the time of the end of the Civil War, in which the, through the Emancipation Proclamation, um, uh, slavery was essentially made um, illegal in a way. It was kind of not full, it was not really fully ended, but it was kind of made um, illegal. And just to kind of quickly add off tangent, just a kind of fun fact for you guys, as we all know, um, Abraham Lincoln was the president who signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but fun, not really fun fact, it's kind of an uh, off tangent point. His primary motivation was not because he saw blacks as equal. His primary motivation for the Emancipation Proclamation was to take away power from the Confederacy at the time. Because remember, at the time, the Union and the Confederacy were, were at war during, during the Civil War. And so the Emancipation Proclamation was more of a wartime strategy than a humanitarian effort. So just kind of a quick uh, reminder, reminder there. So during, but during this time, um, she goes into how to the Civil War, um, the, the Southern states fell into an economic depression of sorts, because, of sorts, because at the time, the Southern states depended heavily on slave labor in order to, to maintain their products. So the Emancipation Proclamation um, really hit them hit them hard, and this and after the Civil War, of course, the states were in debt due to how much they spent on the war. And at this time, the author says that um, finding a new way to um, have racial, basically a racial hierarchy between the primary motivation for Southern whites at that time, according to according to the author. Um, she then starts speaking about um, the black codes, how, how these were implemented at the time. Black codes are basically, these were laws which were implemented to kind of further oppress uh, newly freed uh, black people. This also included um, laws that were known as uh, vagrancy laws, which were laws that were, essentially this meant that they were like laws against homelessness. And so what the southern states did, or some, what, some of the, what some southern states did, is they basically made it illegal for, to, for people not to have a job, right? And they focused the, these laws exclusively, almost exclusively, on the black community, the new slaves. So, of course, many of them at that time didn't have a job because well, they, just, they just very recently became came in. They were complete slaves before. And... Legislators, even themselves, were noted that they did this as a means to keep the dangerous Negroes under their under their control. And she cites one particular law, which stated that all free Negroes and mulattoes mulattoes are basically people of mixed race who have black blood and people like me, for example. They would have to prove with through a written document that they had that they were employed once a year. And so this and other later laws allowed the elite class to take advantage of a loophole within the 13th Amendment, which of course, the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment being the amendment which made slavery uh, federally illegal. 
Does anyone here know what that loophole is? Those of you who watched uh, the 13th documentary should know this answer. Who here can remind me of the loophole within the 13th Amendment? Right, uh, Sister Nahela, you know, don't you? 13th talked about it, do you remember? Um, yeah, so if I remember correctly, it was that it was something about slavery was permitted only, hold on. Um, You're on the right track. Th there was the claw about slavery being permitted. Um, if it was, um, what you call it, um, a crime, if there was a crime involved, something like that. Yes. Right? Correct. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Yay! So, like Sister Nahila said, there is a loophole within the 13th Amendment that made slavery okay if that person was convicted. And I have uh, the 13th Amendment right here for you guys. And we'll just go ahead and read it out loud real quick. So the 13th Amendment says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, except as a punishment for a crime. That loophole within the 13th Amendment gave the elite class an opportunity. And they would use these laws, such as the Black Code, the vacancy laws, as means to somewhat force black, force the black, black community into um, conviction, meaning convicted of crimes becoming prisoners. Once that happened, essentially, slavery was, was back in action. And it was through taking advantage of this loophole that the elite class and the, and the, and the, plan, the plantation owners further oppressed the black community and kind of forced them back into um, being in a lower lower status. So we'll, after that, she really discusses the Reconstruction Era, some of the good things that came from that era. She calls the Reconstruction Era the, the brief but extraordinary period of black advancement. So during this time, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was was passed, this granted Blacks citizenship and the right to vote. On top of that, the federal government also made it a federal crime to inhibit citizens from voting, which allowed them to send federal troops to uh, states in order to protect the Black vote, which at the, before this time, people from the Ku Klux Klan were essentially attacking uh, Black Americans for, for trying to vote. On this time also, the Freedmen's Bureau was, was founded, which uh, was responsible for providing food um, and basic necessities to those who, are, who were recent slaves in order to kind of give them a fighting chance, right? On top of that, a public education system was implemented for uh, the black community at, at this time. So she, says, she talks about this very briefly because she says this was a brief moment in art history in which the black community was given tools to start really taking steps forward. But unfortunately, she mentioned that things go from really bad to worse from, from this point. And this is when she starts speaking about uh, the, the, new, the birth of the Jim Crow era. And she speaks about how um, during the time towards the end of Reconstruction, there was this growing fear within the white community, both the elite and the poor white of this idea of Negro supremacy, this idea of, for the poor whites that these people who were slaves not that long ago, who were considered less than who not long ago, may possibly not only be our equal, but actually be above us. And for, for poor whites, and with who many of which during, um, during this time were in this um, type of depression, um, economic and agricultural depression, um, this really scared them, right? And so this 
a lot of legislators and a lot of leaders took, at the time took advantage of that to say that they're going to fight against these reconstruction laws. They're going to fight against the uh, Freeman Bureau, and they're going to make sure that you know they destroy any possibility of Negro supremacy becoming a, a reality, right? And this is where a mass campaign um, by the Ku Klux Klan started, the campaign of white supremacy. And during this time as well, what we, what we discussed previously, a lot of the laws that were submitted through the Civil Rights Act of 1866 were great laws in theory. They were more of iteration of principle. And what I mean by that is these laws were very difficult to actually practically enforce, right? And so while the federal government may have certain laws that say these certain things, it was difficult for the federal government to enforce the implementation of those laws on the southern states. Um, on top of that, as the attacks from the Ku Klux Klan expanded, eventually federal troops were pulled back, which took away uh, any means of protection that Black Americans had against the Klan, which further increased violence against any Black Americans who dared to try and vote. And on top of that, afterwards, also vagrancy laws were once again implemented, like we discussed before, laws that were uh, made to make very minor um, actions a crime, such as being homeless and having a job. But on top of that, they started implementing certain laws in other states, such as you know mischief or insulting gestures as punishable offenses. And again, these were laws which were specifically dedicated for the black community, right? So this further, she mentions here that this was kind of the ignition of the very first mass expansion of incarceration, which again was proportionally towards, towards black people. So after that, and we'll finish in probably the next five minutes and then we'll go into the next four. Michelle then discusses um, three different political philosophies that emerged in the Southern states at that time. This was known as uh, liberal, li liberalism, conservative, and um, populism. And so and she briefly defines each of these words. So liberalism, she says, was basically the idea that all the races should be equal against the idea of segregation, that it went against American values. Surprisingly, this didn't really, um, this, the, the liberal party at that time didn't really get a lot of black, black support. Um, conservatives, th this philosophy, their argument was, I think, was basically that the liberals were forced the, the black community um, to progress before they were ready. So they, so basically their argument was that the black community was, was forced to um, evolve and progress before they really had the tools necessary to do so. Thus, that led to their downfall. Thus, you know, we shouldn't be so fast in creating our legal status. The populist, the populist party had a different approach. According to the author, their approach was very similar to Nathaniel Bacon of the Bacon Rebellion. This idea of class warfare. The idea that it's the elite class that is the enemy and the poor class needs to needs to band together in order to fight for their rights. And she mentioned that during this time, um, the populist movement actually brought the poor whites and the poor black community together for really the true length of the, the for the first time. But she mentions that um, after as a response to this, the uh, elite class and, the, and, the and certain legislators are implementing a lot more segregation laws, like the Jim Crow laws, basically, which kind of further um, reemphasized and reignited within the poor whites the idea that, hey, you guys are superior to them. You don't want to be on their side. You know, you guys are this of the superior of the superior race, and so. With the expansion of more laws of segregation, 
this kind of again divided the poor the poor white community and the poor black community once again because the poor white community wanted to uphold themselves as a superior class because that's really all they had at the time. And due to that, according to the author, this caused the populist party to lose a lot of traction to where eventually both them and the liberalist party kind of pulled back and stopped advocating for uh, equal rights. And she ends this particular segment by saying that the end of is by the end of the 19th century, um, every Southern state had um, segregation laws discriminated against and further disenfranchised the black community. She even cites one particular law, ridiculous. But there was one law that apparently made it illegal for whites and blacks to even play chess. So that just kind of shows you just how complex and complete the Jim Crow laws became. And this is where we'll, uh, inshallah, stop. Um, for our discussion of uh, our summary of this particular uh, chapter. Which we still have more of the chapter to go. After this, she speaks about the, the fall of the Jim Crow and then the birth of mass incarceration. But we went over a lot of stuff on him. So I think it's good for us to uh, stop here. And with that, I'd like to open the floor for any questions, comments, reflections. Any of you who had an opportunity to read the chapter as well. Is there anything else that you wanted to point out about this chapter that I did not? The floor is it's open. Let's go ahead and discuss each other. Um, all right, Sister Prahana, why don't you uh, you go first? As I know that you got to read some of the, some of the chapters today. Or Brother Jeffrey, do you want to go first? I see you have your, your mic on. Oh, about what? Oh, I just got here. What am I going first for? Oh, no, we just uh, finished going over uh, the first half of Chapter 1. Oh. Uh, a lot of the points you actually mentioned last week about in regards to how the poor whites and poor blacks were on equal footing at first, but um, due to, like, Bacon's Rebellion and other things, it's changed. So, I remember you discussed that, I think, briefly last week. Okay, hold on just a second. Let me um, let me get situated here. No, no problem. In the meantime, uh, Sister Frahana, is there anything you wanted to share from from the chapter? Uh, I guess Sister Frahana is uh, camera shy at the moment. Um, brother, brother Hasi, what about yourself? Sorry, I don't have a comment at this time. Yeah. All right. No, no problem. Um, I just want to comment on like how, like when slavery, when slavery started, how, um, you know, like the Indians, the American Indians were not slave material. They were going to fight against, um, you know, the whites who came. And so it was like, it was the like what you said the um when the whites and the and the blacks that came from Europe and they were what was the word when they were indentured servant is what indentured. Europeans were when they first yeah, came over right right and so they were they were the ones who were you know working the plantations and then and then they wanted to give the whites more rights because of them rebelling uh, against the American Indians um, uh, because of um, because of Beacon trying to get, I guess, control of of the land. Right. And right. Um, so so then they realized that they have to put the whites in a different category than the blacks. Um, huh. They gave them more power uh, and more land to like to be controlling the blacks. And um, and then they got more, you know, Africans in there um, because they felt like, you know, these people, you know, they don't have anything and then they would, they bring them over and then just um, as the real slavery, I feel like, you know, the real slavery started um, before they were coming over as, you know, just working the plantation and had the debt. Right. 
No, absolutely. And I thank you, Sister Mary, for uh, bringing that up. I didn't get a chance to mention that. But yes, like Sister Mary said, uh, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Alexander mentioned uh, in one of the part, points that essentially at the time, um, American Indians, Native Americans, of course, now it's a, it's, a, it's a more proper term, they were not seen as slave material by the elite class because they were fighters. They were people who could fight back. Um, on top of that, neither were um, white, white settlers. They were also not the ideal slaves of the elite class at the time. But the African community, who had nowhere to go, who weren't able to really um, implement themselves much of the culture, they were much easier to control and influence the elite class. So due to that lack of power, caused them to heavily invest Kenneth, I wanted yeah. to apologize. I, I had received a call and I could hear you calling me out, but mm -hmm. I couldn't answer. So I didn't get what your question was. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just asking for you to share your thoughts. I know that you uh, read some of the chapter. Yeah, I did. Actually, I, 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 one part that kind of struck me was um, how easy it is to create like a propaganda against a group of people. And I found that to be really sad because how they would call the Indians savages. And then they very easily did the same thing with the, you know, with the slaves. They called them savages and uncouth and uncivilized and whatnot. And then on page 26, where you were talking about the three fifths of a man concept, where um, one person, it says under the terms of countries, founding document slaves were defined as three fifths of a man, not a real human being. And then that really explains where I would get confused where um, you hear things like all men are created equal. So it goes lower in the page and it says Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal. So their, their um, logic is that the Africans, they're not equal. So this doesn't apply for them, you know? So it's just that manipulation and that twist of words that's used, you know, it just, it caught me because I was thinking, you know, it's always said that all men are created equals, equal. So what's the justification of treating someone so badly? And they created their own justification. And, you know, it's just, it was really sad when I was reading that. Um, and um, just, just the concept that propagandas are used even today, like the way the media can twist and turn words and make a whole group of people seem so bad. You know, it, it's just, it was, it was just um, sad to see. Yeah. No, absolutely. And Sister Rowan, I think you made one very powerful, profound point. And I really think we should take a minute to reflect on and that is propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. You know, illustrating and this narrative that this particular group of people are savages, are violent, are evil, are angry are rapists, are this, are that, and creating this feeling of they're less than, than human. And I think this chapter is a good job kind of illustrating for us how dangerous this type of rhetoric can be. And I think it's really important, it's really, really important for us to think about that for a second because, I mean, I don't want to play politics or anything, but you see this type of rhetoric today in from certain uh, leaders that doesn't seem too far off than from the rhetoric you were back then. Rapists, criminals, terrorists, very, very similar words. And I think us as, as Muslims, who of course we stand up against injustice and, and inequality, we have to call it out when we see it. We can't just be like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just some guy, he's just saying for both, it's not, it's not a big deal. We have to call it out because our history shows us what happens when you don't call it out. Our history shows us what happens when you allow propaganda to ensue and the damages it can take. And so I think it's really important for us to, to when we see this type of language being used, regardless of your political views, regardless of, you know, who you want to vote for, who you 
feel represents your values and your more, you got to you got to call it out. You just you got to call it out. I think that's our our responsibility. So Michael Hesse for Hannah for for sharing. It, I think it's something we really need to take note of and pay attention to and make sure that we're not being sucked in that same brainwashing that's going on and definitely call it out. Yeah, that's that's our justice, being the torchbearers for justice. That's what that is. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's right. real important for Muslims to do that because the, the, the Western Christian is not going to do that because that's all part of our culture. That is that 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 that's all part of the Western Christian culture. So I don't think the the uh, and and not all of them, but I believe me, I'd say most the majority of them will follow along those same lines because Christianity was used to enslave not only the Africans but whoever the indigenous population was that what the uh, imperialists or the colonists were trying to take over in the beginning. And they, and they always used, quote unquote, Christianity to do that. So for, for us to think that, you know, because I don't want to just say blatantly all is too 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 horrible of a, a term, but for the most of them, so we'll we'll do that. Yes, but for the most of them, we'll do that. If you don't, if you don't think that's true, just look at the evangelical Christians of today. They, they follow the same mantra, that they followed 300 years ago or 400 years prior. Right, you definitely have um, you definitely have a segment of the community with uh, that ideology. Right, and now of course, while uh, we don't advocate that, is that something that Christianity teaches? Just like we don't advocate that Islam teaches. Um, just like how we have some extremist views, well, certain parts of religion trying to justify their actions, Christianity was manipulated and used by. Um, during the colonial times to justify these, these actions. Um, not that the religion itself would advocate these things, but it would be um, taken take, you know, out of context and manipulated um, in order to justify um, certain, certain actions. And so it's very important to us, like Sister Rahana mentioned, we don't, we don't make sure we don't fall into those types of, types of traps. And to add to Jeffrey's point, we as Muslims have to up against this not just not just because no one else could do it or anything like that, but because this is our um, obligation. This is our religious obligation that Allah Subhanahu Taala has imputed upon us. Allah says, "O you who believe, you know, stand firmly for justice and equity, equality, even if it is against yourself and and your and your relatives." That's how. Much will oh, emphasize the importance of standing up for for justice and standing up against um, oppression and and, and in, in, in injustice. So it, it's religiously obligated upon us to, to to call these things out as, as well. All right. Um, is anyone else has anyone want to share a question they want to ask? Uh, I know we went over a lot of information. Um, if there's something I said that people want to kind of want me to elaborate on, please don't you know, be afraid to, to ask. All right. If there are no more uh, questions or comments, we can just go ahead and close a uh, few minutes uh, early today. Um, Sister Nahil, do we have any announcements that we need to we need to make? Um, so just, um, what day is today? today That's <sighs> okay. So tomorrow we have a uh, reverts reality, inshallah. And then, uh, Friday, the, the Friday reminder, I believe Saturday we have the one one class and also, um, on Sunday we have little Muslims and we have the, is it your, uh, yes, it's going to be the brothers, the brothers by weekly chat. Yeah, and we have our sisters halakha in the morning on Saturday as well, nine o'clock. Like what has happened again. So yeah, we have uh, something going on every day, guys. So please uh, to try and join and be part of the be part of the group, inshallah. So next uh, next Wednesday, inshallah, we'll go ahead and we'll finish up chapter one with a discussion on the yeah. death of Jim Crow and then the birth of.
And, and cannot we have a Hadith rush tomorrow? Oh, yes, that's right. Tomorrow we have our Hadith rush. This is our um, leadership building program, which a different Embrace member. We do discussions every Hadith um, every week. So I heavily encourage all of you to do that. It's going to be done 8 o'clock Central Time, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, only for one hour. Everyone is encouraged to come, uh, learn, share your views on different Hadith. It should be a good time, inshallah. And so with that, we can go ahead and close. Allahumma subhanahu wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa an astaghfirullah wa atubu ilaik. Jazakum wa khair everyone. May Allah reward all of you with good. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.